This is a word cloud from the wiki page of what is crowdsourcing. Because if you're going to do a, a what if talk, the first place to look is towards the crowd. So I have crowdsourced an awful lot of this talk. Now, obviously, my name does not appear on the what is crowdsourcing page, but I've sort of just sort of weaved it in. And it's interesting the key words that sort of come up here crowdfunding, demographics, crowd workers, criticisms. It's a very interesting world. Um, it's a world that has changed our research lab quite a bit, and I, has, I think it has the potential to change academic research quite a bit too. Uh, Web3, not really going to talk about this too much because you could talk for hours and hours on end, let alone what Web2 is, let alone Web3. But it's just, Web2 is read-write. This is where we are now. It's a social network, it's a social world. I'm always on my phone, I'm tweeting, I'm sharing information. And therefore, I leave traces about me out there. Web3 is about using these new toolkits, the toolkits which Talisman are writing, and just knowing that the web is everywhere. I won't have to think about it, just everything I own will be connected to the web. And that means we can try and predict what the future may or may not look like in probably shorter and shorter terms. So I've crowdsourced this. This is what crowdsourcing is. If the sound works. Crowdsourcing was coined in May 2006 when Jeff Howe wrote an article for Wired magazine called The Rise of Crowdsourcing. Since then, Jeff has become the king of crowdsourcing. His definition? Crowdsourcing is the act of taking a job traditionally performed by a designated employee and outsourcing it to an undefined, generally large group of people in the form of an open call. Whilst this may sound confusing, it's not. Wikipedia is one of the earliest examples of crowdsourcing. Although through its own success, its accuracy often comes into question. Apparently, David Beckham was a Chinese goalkeeper in the 18th century, and Richard Gere appears on the back of the Australian $10 note, dressed as a woman. X Factor is another example. The contestants and the scripted misfits and oddballs on the show are the crowd, and the panel of makeup and high waist trousers that are the judges manage the crowd. Again, this form of crowdsourcing might fail. Can it last over time, given only one singer makes it? So what's the trick to nailing crowdsourcing? It's probably managed, focused crowds. Here's an example. Say hi to Zach. Zach's a freelancer and digs the freedom it gives him. But sometimes poor Zach doesn't get taken seriously enough by some of the bigger, swankier clients who end up giving loads of cash to corporate companies like Walter here. Just because he's bigger, poor Zach. He knows he could do a better job but needs a way of getting noticed. Then, Zach had a great idea. An idea so neat he knew it would change the world of freelancing forever. In essence, Zach's idea was pretty simple. One, build and unify a crowd of TikTok freelancers. Two, give them a web platform. Three, manage and market the crowd. Four, take on Goliath. So now Zach and his co-freelancer buddies are managing their crowd and they can finally take on big old Walter over there. In fact, as you can see, Zack and co are quicker, more diverse and cheaper than Walter, which equals more happy clients. Walter's now struggling to keep up with Zack. Walter's got huge overhead, so he keeps getting bogged down, whilst Zack and co can grow and grow and grow. In fact, they could become the largest group of managed freelancers in the world, so sinking Walter. Well done, Zach. You can take a bow, because you've not only freed the freelancers and made them richer, but you've also made more smiley clients. Oh, and slayed another Goliath. What is crowdsourcing to you? Come and have your say at whatiscrowdsourcing.com. Also crowdsourcing.org, should, should you so wish. So the interesting thing is Zach could be an RA, and he's struggling to write research grants. You know, it's... It's, it's quite scary. It's always the big, slow players with the academic red tape that often get the funding. And then three years later, you think, well, what have they actually done? Whereas if Zach, as an RA, could crowdsource his research, he could change the world. He could change the research world without going to any of the academic funding boards that we normally do. You know, the academic world is beginning to change. 
And there's a series of lessons throughout this entire talk, often lessons for me rather than you. But there's a number of ways. There's crowdfunding, there's crowd toolkits, crowd labour is the interesting thing. Ethics kicks in then. Uh, involving the public, community building, collective knowledge. Collective knowledge was arguably where the term crowdsourcing came from first. But if you go back to 1714, John Harrison, the call to make a timepiece that worked at sea, was this crowdsourcing? You've got a big problem that needs to be solved. You don't know how to solve it. You put a call out. John solved it. 1857, we needed to write down all the words that we know. A call was put out and by 1884 they'd only reached the word ant because they were just too slow. They were a small academic group so they put it out to the crowd and about 6,000 or so people contributed to, to it and they put this book together. It contains all the words that we know. Crowdsourcing, 1884. The collective knowledge is the intriguing bit. Because there's all this knowledge out there, and from a research point of view, we always rely on various data sets that are known. There's data sets out there that we can gather ourselves. If we just have the faith that it's, just not, all, it's not all just noise, but there's nuggets of information in there. The one that is always quoted is Galaxy Zoo. Um, every crowdsourcing talk probably has to have Galaxy Zoo in it. So it's a 60-second social on Galaxy Zoo. There's volunteers out there basically identifying things. And they sit at home, they have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, and they just click things. And it goes through, and you're using the crowd to do a massive job that a computer can't quite do. So we talk about machining things an awful lot, but often the crowd is much better than a great big grid or a great big net network. So it's how you can use the crowd from a research point of view. It's not easy to do. You know, we can write about it from an academic point of view. The crowd is out there, shouldn't we all use it? When you go and try it yourself, it's not necessarily easy. But I'm interested in ones that combine various techniques. So they put toolkits online. They use the cloud labour. I don't necessarily like that, that, that term because it ethics begin to kick in, you're not paying people, should you allow people to do your own research. But to get some sort of collective community out there, because we're always online. OpenStreetMap is lesson one. Uh, Mr. Steve Coast used to sit in our lab, CASA, and we used to have a conversation about how bad a national mapping agency was and how restrictive, and oh God, you can't use the data, and you can't put it online, and why, does, why is the UK funding this stuff? And if he, like Zach the fish, had written a research grant of, hey, I want to map the world, uh, he had no PhD, he just wouldn't have ever got it through. So he left our research lab, shouldn't have let him go. And he mapped the world, openstreetmap.com. This is Oxford, where we are now, St. Catherine's Col College. Every line here, every word has been contributed by users around the world. So he just put a toolkit online, had a blank map, and he wanted to put an open source map that anyone can use to get away, to get around the national data system. To say, look, you don't, you don't need these guys. You, we can do it ourselves. 
And he had people on bikes with GPS units at first, just cycling around and uploading their GPS tracks. This is, I just zoomed into a random place in the world here from here, just to say almost everywhere in the world, they're not quite there yet. It's been running since 2004, probably 2006 is when it properly kicked in. But they've mapped almost the entire world. This was Eric, little RA, and he saw the big national mapping whale and see how it was lumbering and couldn't catch up with the Web2 world where licensing was free and went and mapped it himself. This is the users mapping the world in 2008. It's just people logging in. So this is how the toolkit works. So if researchers can put toolkits online, which are easy to use, the crowd will arguably do the rest. This is, to, to be honest, just because mapping is my world, this is phenomenal. The guy who used to sit in our lab has built OpenStreetMap, uh, got funding a couple of years ago, now lives in San Francisco with his wife and drives open top sports cars. I believe that is lesson one. But just knowing there's a community out there, and if you put a call out, the world will often answer that call. And it can do social good too, because you've got the users there, so you've got the community built. So Haiti had an earthquake. There was no map. This is a 24-hour map of Haiti being mapped after the earthquake. The World Bank used this map to sort out where they have to get aid. So people just knew there was an earthquake there, logged in, made the map. The servers sit behind our lab, so we serve all of this out. Happiness was just raised. How do we know how happy people are? Ask them. Just ask them using your nose. The phone that's in my pocket. Ask me five times a day how happy I am and I will tell you. George, in our lab, has made a map called, an app called Mappiness. It asks you that question. How happy are you five times a day? And we grab your geolocation. And we grab a sample of noise, should you so wish. And we can take a photograph. So we're doing colour matching too. People like to be around the colour green, turns out. But we grab time stamps, and this reached the Apple front page. Millions of users around the world have used mappiness. And it asks you each day, and it gives you little graphs. It allows you to feel part of it. So beginning to feel part of it is core to crowdsourcing. You're not just sucking it in, you're allowing people to get feedback by putting toolkits or apps online. So this was his PhD research. And to have a researcher which can do a PhD that gets on the Apple front page, it raises the game from what we should expect of crowdsourcing. We've made various mapping systems out there which allow people to upload their own maps. Uh, sort of local council aimed maps. We've uploaded all of the census maps actually because I find it incredibly frustrating that I have to log in to some national data service with a little password to find data. I don't want to. I want to see what it looks like first. I want the crowd to upload it if they can and I can download it should I so wish in an interface that is not a portal or some sort of system which frightens people away. So we crowdsourced surveys. We did Radio 4 first. Uh, this was Credit Crunch 1.0. I think we're on 2 now. And Radio 4 asked through the week, were people worried about paying their mortgage, the fuel, food prices? And we asked people their postcode. And we mapped it in real time. So as people logged into the Radio 4 website, the map would automatically change. So using the crowd, time stamping, geolocating, 
to get some sort of pattern, some sort of survey toolkit. And we thought, oh, well, what if we put the survey toolkit out to the crowd? You know, what would that do? What if we allowed anyone in the world to ask anyone else in the world whatever they wish? But first, we got a phone call from Look East. And I always wanted to see our research used in a weather forecast sort, sort of way. We're this is what Look East did. Of what life is like across the region, and we need your help. If you go to the Look East website and look for our section on antisocial behaviour, you'll get the chance to say what's going on in your part of the world. Of course, this is not scientific, just a snapshot. You have to fill in your postcode and choose one of the options, for example, noisy neighbours. You'll then be able to see a colour-coded map of the region. So far, more than 2,000 of you have taken part, and this is what the map is showing. Red is for drunken youths, yellow for noisy neighbours, light blue for boy racers, dark blue for no problems, and green for great community with no problems. It's based on postcodes, so just because there's a lot of one colour, it doesn't mean that whole area has a huge problem. Remember, rural postcodes are big. It's not scientific. This was a bit of a wake-up call. Oh, we don't do survey methods. We do tech. We need to put the science behind the scenes. So we've got the crowd, we've got people to use it, but we need proper scientific methods. So every time we do a BBC News, they don't say, this is QCL research and it's not scientific, because it doesn't go down well. <laughs> but we've done it in uh, um, Look North, B BBC South, a whole range of um, um, outreach type work. And then we took it completely to the crowd. So we threw away all of the academic branding. If you're going to put it to the crowd, don't frighten them off. And we put a survey method online which allowed anyone in the world to ask what they want. It's been used by the mayor's office. It's been used by the crowd called surveymapper.com. It's quite difficult to put an easy to use toolkit which allows people to make questionnaires let alone then ask them a geographic location as well. So there's been all sorts of learning curves through this. This is Survey Mapper 1.0. We're working in Talisman on Survey Mapper 2 to put the science in there. But we've hidden the science from the website to get the users in. I don't know whether it's a midlife academic crisis or what, but I think if you don't frighten people off, we've headed it up by a cross-eyed giraffe called Roger appears on the right hand side. Just to say, look, this toolkit's out there, you can use it, and you can download the raw data afterwards. So it's all there from an academic point of view, but we don't have to frighten people off with UCL logos or terms and conditions. And, and there's other sites out there which obviously you're getting asked your view all the time, and they're collecting people people's views. TripAdvisor. I'm almost addicted to the site. I went to a, a guest house in Penzance which was horrendous. But the highlight of the trip was uploading to TripAdvisor in my room and saying how horrendous that place is. So they're crowdsourcing. They just put photographs up. In the fact, they don't really do that. They get you to do all of the work. Crowdfunding intrigues me too. Uh, it's not, not because it's hard to get research funding, oh, this is why we're all here, but there's different routes. Kickstarter.com, I'm almost addicted to this too. Just because you can buy some really cool kit, which is not in the shop. Since its creation, the internet has increasingly become a venue for artists and creative types to share and promote their work. Unfortunately, this increase in use sometimes makes it more difficult to discover artists that are serious about developing their ideas and to find work that is genuinely unique and inspiring. It's also nearly impossible to support these artists until they have actually produced something you can buy. Enter Kickstarter. Since 2009, this fundraising platform has helped to bridge the gap between the artist and the consumer. In less than two years, Kickstarter has helped artists of all kinds raise millions of dollars to fund their dreams. As a member of Kickstarter, you can share in the creative process of other artists by contributing funding to their projects. You can also share a creative project of your own and receive funding from other members to help during the developmental stage of your project. 
So kickstart.com, the people give the money, the people give the ideas, and systems, you know, raise millions and millions of pounds on it, and then they ship their ideas, or they do community outreach artwork, and people fund it. You know, some things only need five or 10K. It's often quite hard to get that. And you sit in the research lab and think, oh, this would be ace. And they think, oh, maybe, maybe Kickstarter. I don't know. Rather than looking at the routes which are currently out, out there. So it's one of those sites that once you get on, you will start funding things. And that sort of feels nice too, because you're funding the latest research out of your own money. Or sometimes we have money left in, in our research grants, which we'd spend by the end of year. What if we had an academic Kickstarter where we could kick in 2K, 3K, and fund research there and then? This is a t-shirt shop, Threadless. 30 million pounds turnover, set up a couple of years ago. They don't do anything. They sell t-shirts, but people upload the design of the shirts and then they vote on the shirts, and then they buy the shirts. So Threadless just ship the shirts. That's all they do. And yet they were one of the US's largest growing companies. <coughs> Which makes me think, oh my god, we need to have a workshop on this. So sure enough, Talisman is doing a brainstorming workshop in September to see what training we can put in place first. Because it's very hard to train this stuff. Because all it is, is a website. You could knock up eight of these in a day and see which one flies. So we did our own crowdsourcing stuff, talesofthings.com. Big fan of the Antiques Roadshow. It's an age thing. Um, where people queue up and they want to be told about their things. You shouldn't have to be told about the things. The things should be crowdsourced. The things should talk back to you something called the Internet of Things. Mix of Facebook, Antiques Roadshow and eBay. And we're working with Oxfam on it. And we've been crowdsourcing people. Hi, I'm Annie Lennox and I'm donating this rather interesting, fabulous, unique dress which I actually wore to a rather splendid occasion which happened to be Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday party at Hyde Park in London. So if you buy this and wear it, that's what you so can tell your friends. crowdsourcing stories, narratives for Oxfam. Turns out people like to know where their clothes came from in second-hand shops. That dress is probably worth £20 because she owned it. It sold for £170. So you can add worth to retail goods. And we're, from a research point of view, we're grabbing geographic location. I want to know where things are. We're making things read right to. Uh, we've just made Oxfam's first iPhone app too. So they've trusted us to put it out to their crowd. And crowdsourcing the narrative of things, which is an interesting take on the research. So geography is always at the core of everything that we do. But it's interesting from the research world that lots of people throw geography away. But surely it's at the core of how we understand an awful lot of this work. Um, the, a well-known national newspaper gave us a fantastic write-up and the, the press has been ace and two years ago they called us the next Facebook. I don't think they, they were right, mm -hmm. which is why I'm here giving a talk on what is crowdsourcing <laughs> rather than being in San Francisco with my new wife and uh, open top sports, sports car. We're crowdsourcing stories from a a word cloud point of view, this is the first Talisman app which comes out next month, textual. So it takes open source text, it creates a word cloud. There's a lot of word cloud toolkits out there. But you can click on these words and see what they mean, see what their relationships are. And we grab geolocation at the same time. So I'm really interested when this goes live of who's reading what where, because this is a global app. So we're bringing location to narrative research. And before I came to NCOM, I didn't know what narrative research was, to be quite frank, because it's not our world. But it's interesting how the nodes can merge and we can begin to learn from each, nerd, each node 
and get the research in there, but do crowdsourcing for narratives. This is just our first try. So there's various types. There's the crowdfunding, Kickstarter. Um, I'm interested in perhaps an academic kick, kick, Kickstarter for research, which is sometimes tricky to fund. There's the shared systems, the open strip, street map. There's the cloud labor. TripAdvisor, Second Life. Second Life is a virtual world. It was just a blank plot of land. It was a computer with just a little green piece of grass. People bought other pieces of grass and they logged in and they bought houses and they built worlds and they built towns and everything they built, someone else paid for. So you type your credit card number in and it's just, it's just genius. So there must be ways within the academic community that we can crowdfund and crowdsource quite a lot of this creative type research. So if there's a massive task that we want to complete, I don't know, like mapping the world or translating documents or mapping the stars, you can create a very simple toolkit and you can just put it out there. Now it might not fly, not everything does. But we're quite well linked in now. Our academic network is quite large. We're online, we tweet, we share, we blog. We can call the crowd in. And if we offer the crowd something back, we can use them. So JISC recently did an elevator pitch, which was interesting. 10K, you uploaded a YouTube clip and you asked for funds. I'm intrigued by that because we put all of our work onto YouTube. Therefore, everything is rated. Everyone rates everyone else. So if our work is poor, people within almost 30 seconds will say, Andy, that's rubbish. I think, oh. But it allows you to refine your research because everything is rated. There's sites which rates our lectures, rate, rate myprofessor.com. You can even rate whether they're hot or not online. Not sure whether that's a good thing or not. But nevertheless, we're beginning to get rated a lot more. But we're also interested in the crowd or data mining. So not just crowdsourcing, but people have often clicked yes to those little terms that we click yes to. Twitter, I've clicked yes to the terms. Can't say that I actually read them. No one does. But it allows us to pull in data feeds. There's more and more data feeds. This is our city dashboard. Org. <coughs> Talisman output number two coming <coughs> soon, although it's just online in a beta form. So pulling in all of these data feeds from the number of buses on the streets to underground trains, background radiation count. I bought a radiation counter, plugged it in, put it online. Uh, eight places around the UK. There's a mapping version too. The map doesn't quite work yet. Yeah? It just doesn't feel right. But putting data dashboards online and then trying to gather the data. So we've just bought a whole bank of hard disks to not just look at the data, but to stream it and therefore try and make sense of it. So try and make sense from a modeling point of view of what London's going to look like in 30 minutes time. It's a unique research challenge. And this is London during a Twitter weekend. So we grab everything. Not grab, grabs, grabs the wrong word, that sounds bad. We mine, we data mine twi Twitter. And because you click yes, we know where you are, we know what you've said, and we know exactly what time that is. So we know where people are. From a social analysis point of view, you know, this is gold dust as long as you're looking at the sort of people that tweets. But you know, this is early research. We're not ruling out everything that's gone on in the past. We're just saying there's new methods out there that perhaps we can use. Just to run onto Heathrow Runway 1. It's where you're meant to have your phone turned off. It's a big sign. Turn your phone off. Lots of people tweet. It's the planes landing or the planes taking off. So we fly out to a suburb view now. Go to someone's house, you might not be able to read the text. But he texts, tweets, happy birthday, kiss, kiss, kiss. 
our vet, he or she, does not realise how we can zoom into your house. We know where you live. We know what you've said. Was it to your wife? Don't know. But then ethics kick in, although do ethics kick in? Is the, academic, is the research world changing so fast that the ethics system is struggling like that big whale? I'm not going to touch that with a barge pole, by, by, by the way. But that's interesting that we know where people are and, and we can mine stuff. So crowdsourcing excites me more than it probably should. And this is, or was, what is crowdsourcing? Thank you very much.